Hello, and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. This is week 3, segment 5, where we will take a look at what file ownership and permissions are applied when we create a new file. In the process, we learn about the concept of a process's UMask and look at how the UMask shell built in is implemented. Okay, so far we've covered changing permissions and ownerships, and in the process we've repeatedly created new files to work with. But how does the system decide what file ownership and permissions new files should get? The decision making process is a bit easier here. When a new file is created, the new owner of the file is the effective UID of the process. That makes sense. The group ID of the file, however, may depend on the Unix version or how it is configured. On most Linux systems, the default setting is to inherit group ownership from the effective group ID of the process. On BSD-derived systems, the default is to inherit group ownership from the directory in which the file is created. The rationale for this behavior is that in multi-user systems, people want to collaborate in groups and the directory owned by a given group should imply group ownership therein. Let's observe this in practice. We create a new directory under temp. The new directory has a group ownership of real, which is the group ownership of temp. Creating a new file under dir should then also get a group ownership of real. Okay, looks alright. What if we'd shown the directory to users? Aha! Now the new file is also group owned by users, because the directory it was created in was too. Of course the previous file retains its group ownership. But Sharma is a member of both users and wheel. What if the directory was owned by another group, one Sharma was not a member of? Let's give it a try. Ah, look at that! File 3 inherited the daemon group ownership from the directory, even though Sharma is not a member of the daemon group. Wait, does that mean I can create files owned by groups I'm not a member of? There. Now I have a program that's owned by daemon. And I'm the owner of that file, so I should be able to change the permissions. Doesn't that mean I could escalate my privileges to those of the daemon group? Phew. Fortunately, that doesn't work. Our smart permissions, as discussed earlier, still apply. Alright, now let's see what this looks like on the Linux system. Here we have my home directory and my groups. The new directory has the same group ownership as the current directory, which also happens to be my primary group. If we create a new file, It gets the same group owner. Does this system then also inherit group ownership from the directory? Let's change the group ownership to null. Aha! The new file does not inherit group ownership of the directory, but will always get the group ownership from the primary group ID of the process it looks like. As I mentioned, different systems behave differently, and it's important to know the difference when administrating them. But okay, that covers default ownership. What about permissions? For that, we have the UMask. A UMask is the file creation mode mask, in which any bits toggled on are turned off when creating a file. You can set a UMask in your process to ensure that any files created later on will have certain default permissions. To do that, you call the UMask syscall. Note that the UMask only applies to the current process. The system may have a default UMask set for new processes that differs from yours. While many of you have probably used the UMask shell built-in, let's run through our last command examples in this video segment to illustrate how it works. Here's our program umask.c. In it, we have a call to open that will create a new file with permissions as specified. Read, write, exec for the user, group and others. Recall from our earlier lecture that the permissions specified here are subject to the process's current UMask, 
meaning bits in the UMask are turned off at file creation time, even if open specified them. So the first time we call this function, we will have, we will have whatever UMask we inherited from the shell. Then we explicitly turn off all bits in the UMask, meaning we will allow the permissions the open call has specified. Prior to the third call, we set a UMask that should turn off group and other permissions. Let's run it. Our current UMask is 0022, meaning we want to turn off by default group and other write permissions. When we create a new file, it is created with mode 644, allowing read and write access to the user, but only read access to groups and others. Now we run our program. The resulting file looks like so. Recall that our open call requested read write exec permissions for all user group and others each time. The first file, file 1, our UMask turned off the write bits. For file 2, we explicitly turned off the UMask and thus got all the permissions open requested. For file 3, we turned off group and other read write permissions, but left exact permissions in place. Let's change our UMask to a different value, 077, and try again. 077 means that we disable by default read, write, and exact permissions for group and others. And so our newly created file only gets mode 0600 and our program will create files almost identical to the first time around for the cases where the program set the UMask, but different for where it inherited the UMask from the shell. Make sense? If not, and even if, Play around with setting the UMask in your shell to certain values to ensure you understand the effect on newly created files. Alright, we did it! We learned all about file permissions and ownerships, effective UIDs and group IDs, and changing them and how the system enforces permissions. In this short video, we discussed the UMask and how it allows the user to influence the default permissions with which new files are created. With all that, you should now be able to implement most of the chown and schmutt commands, as well as the stat command. In fact, come to think of it, with what we've learned so far, you should actually be able to write a version of ls that's close to the system's ls. You know what? Let's just do that. It'll be a midterm coding assignment, and I promise you, it'll be fun. Please carefully read the assignment at this URL here, and we'll discuss it in our next class. In the next video segment, we'll talk a bit about directories as we prepare for our week 4 materials, file systems, and the number of mixed system data calls. Thanks for watching, and until next time. Cheers!